Canada's largest province is taking its first steps towards reopening the economy. Ontario Premier Doug Ford has announced that some businesses can reopen on Monday as long as they comply with, of course, strict public health measures. The CBC's Mike Crawley joins us now from Toronto with some more details. Hi, Mike. Great to see you. Hi, Vashi. So tell us a bit more about what uh, the Premier announced today, what businesses are affected. So a lot of these are seasonal businesses, Vashi, that really need to get opening as soon as possible if they're going to have uh, any impact on, on their own uh, sort of business plan. So we're talking garden centers and nurseries are the first two. Uh, the, they would be allowed to be open for curbside pickup. Uh, then you're looking at such things like lawn care and landscaping. Those businesses would be allowed to open. Uh, they're going to also allow essen certain essential construction projects in quite a wide range of sectors. So, uh, you know, any building of schools or colleges and universities, that kind of thing, uh, and also anything that can help the, with the COVID-19 response. Uh, car washes, because uh, I guess nobody really wants to wash their car in the wintertime, uh, uh, in the springtime more so. Car dealerships are going to be allowed to be open by appointment only. And then uh, golf courses and marinas, they're allowed to start getting ready to open, not to open for the public, but to get their businesses in line. So it's a small, very specific uh, number of businesses that are going to be allowed to reopen starting on Monday and uh, the Premier says this does kind of give a bit of a glimmer of hope uh, because look the economy like everywhere across Canada has been quite battered uh, and uh, when Premier Ford uh, was asked about that he said that before COVID-19 Ontario's economy was booming. We're going to get back to that point it may not be tomorrow but I have all the confidence in the world and the, and the businesses here in this province and, and the creativity, uh, and we're behind them. We're going to have this economy humming again. We're going to have it moving forward, and uh, we're going to continue supporting small businesses. Matter of fact, we're going to be supporting all, all businesses. However, the Premier didn't give any specific details of what form that support uh, for businesses to get back on their feet is, is going to be. Fashi. We've been talking, Mike, all week with uh, you know reporters from various provinces as well as listening to premiers talk about their plans to reopen their respective economies. I think the question that we're all, uh, many of us are asking ourselves is, okay, well, what kinds of things do you need? What metrics do you need? Or what tools do you have in the tool chest to figure out what is safe to open and how quickly things can go and the speed at which that, that recovery or that reopening, rather, I should put it, uh, will go. For Ontario, what kind of factors are they looking at? Yeah, this is one of the interesting things, right? Different provinces are taking different approaches to it. So Ontario's number one thing that they want to see is the daily number of cases coming down uh, over a two to four week period. So we're at a stage right now in Ontario where that number has come down basically for the past week. So got to be another steady week or so of that at the minimum. Uh, but the factors that they also need to have uh, ready uh, is um, what they call contact tracing. So they, they, they've set a target so that uh, public health units are able to contact 90% of the contacts of every single new case within a 24 hour period period of that person testing positive. So uh, there's definitely going to be some questions as we get closer to that as to whether Ontario's public health units have that capacity. They've actually had um, volunteer medical students coming in and helping with contact tracing uh, during the, the peak of the pandemic. So uh, and then another thing is, is the province's testing capacity going to be up to speed? They're doing uh, close to uh, 15,000 tests a day now. Uh, and so that's that's a pretty good number. And if that you know continues to 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 be available that's going to definitely be a thing that is going to make it easier at least for them to reopen uh, the economy and allow for the possibility that there could be uh, a, a spike in new cases and that they would be able to quickly get on that and be able to track it gotcha okay thanks mike appreciate all the information the cbc's mike crawley for us in toronto Premier Ford's announcement is the latest move, as I mentioned, in provincial plans to reopen their respective economies. But do the choices of businesses and services being allowed to start up again make sense? And could differing provincial plans cause any confusion for the public? Medical columnist and family physician Dr. Peter Lynn joins us now from Toronto. Hi, Dr. Lynn. Great to see you. 
Good to see you again, Beth. I should mention to both you and our viewers that we are awaiting an update uh, from the province of Alberta, the chief medical officer there. So we'll take you to that update uh, as soon as it becomes available. But we did have some important questions. Alberta is actually one of the provinces yesterday that announced what their sort of phase plan would look like. I'm getting a lot of questions, and I'll put some specific ones to you, but many, Dr. Lynn, that revolve around sort of, I'm hearing all these different things from various provinces, or I live in my province, and they're saying this will open in a week, this will open in two weeks. What does it mean for my own behavior? Like, what's the best advice you have for us about how we should govern ourselves as restrictions become uh, eased? Yeah, so we're very confused, right? So some places you can get a haircut, some places you can get a massage, you can play golf, but not in this place. You should go to a park or maybe you shouldn't go to a park. So then people are confused. And mainly because every province is trying to look at their own situation, right? How many cases do they have? Uh, as you were saying, you know, the numbers have to keep coming down. And where are the cases? So let's say you're in a rural area, there's been no cases at all then, you know, should you be following the same rules? But for example, I'm in Toronto, lots of cases here. So therefore, I don't think they're going to let things open up uh, too too freely here. Uh, but you can imagine, let's say, Barrie, which is about an hour away, let's say all their barbershops are open. So their hair places are open. So I'll just drive up there. So now I can bring the virus up into that area. So that's why it's a little tricky. And none of these governments have ever had to make these decisions because we've never shut down a government or an economy uh, in this particular fashion. So the things that we need to remember is just basic principles principles. So the virus needs to get to you and it's only propelled by airflow, like wind. Okay. So therefore I have to cough, sneeze, I have to breathe and laugh with you. And then that's how the virus will get across to you, or it's going to come on your hands. So basically for your, for your instructions, for, for your normal behavior is you will still want to stay six feet away because the wind cannot reach you. And then just don't put your hands up to your face, you know, wash and so on and so forth. So if you keep those rules, then wherever you go to grocery stores, supermarket, whatever it is that you're going to be going to just follow those same rules individually. Whereas I think right now, each of the provinces are trying to pick the, the businesses that are lowest risk. So golf, there's lots of space between mm -hmm. people. But then the four people sitting in the same cart, they could exchange to each other. So instead of saying have only 10 people at a meeting, you should say, you know, 10 people have to be separated by six feet. So give them the parameters. And then that way, each business can figure out how they should meet that uh, six foot distancing, et cetera. Okay, part of what we're talking about when we talk about opening up the economy is testing capacity. Two different kinds of testing you've explained before, diagnostic and then testing for immunity. Lots of questions this week about that and how it might work. There's a task force now set up in this country led by uh, Dr. David Naylor. I got a question uh, from a viewer who says, when will we definitely know if you can catch this twice? Uh, so we already had some weird cases. So, for example, it, we, we look at China, for example, China and South Korea, they've now had people that retest positive. So they had the disease, two negative tests, and then now they're testing positive again. South Korea is a little bit forthcoming with their information. So we're, we're looking to them for some guidance. So could it be that the virus never went away? So those two tests in the middle were wrong. Uh, could it be that the virus is coming back like it's a mutation? So therefore, they're getting a second infection again. Or could it be that the virus never left the body? Body. So in other words, that person is a carrier, in which case they will carry that virus. And we've heard about carriers with hepatitis B, for example, that's a virus infection of the liver, and that one can stay with you. You don't win, and the virus doesn't win, and you're in a stalemate. And so that person can continue to infect other people. So that's the biggest fear that we have. So in South Korea, they're looking at those people, retesting them. In China, there was a case where the guy kept testing for almost 50 days. So for 50 days afterwards, he was locked up in his apartment, like he was having all sorts of psychological problems. And so we're worried about this thing. So right now we're testing to find out, do you have the disease? What's going to happen is that we might have to retest those people that have recovered. So then we would know, are these people carrying the virus yet again? Because, but we don't have that, um, that ability right now. So public health is very busy, just, just contact tracing and trying to test people. But I think once we have a bit of breathing space, we should go back and revisit some of these folks that have recovered and we should re-swab them. And if we see that they're negative, 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 then we can be rest assured that there's no carriers around. But if we start seeing people swabbing positive and they're feeling well, then we need to protect other people from them. So that becomes a big issue as we're talking about this opening up of the economy. Uh, we do have to test those people that have recovered to make sure that they're still not carrying viruses. And that actually leads me to another question from a viewer who asks, how does an, asympt how does an asymptomatic case of COVID-19 spread the virus? Yeah, so this is the weird thing about this particular virus. 
with SARS in 2003, you sort of got sick already. So you looked ugly and so people stayed away from you or you were so sick you ended up in the hospital. So with SARS, you tended to infect the people in the hospital. So I would go in, I would infect my you know, roommate, so to speak, and that's what we heard on the news. In this case, the days before you have the uh, symptoms, you know, the runny nose and things like that, you're already making copies of it, which means that this thing can borrow our photocopiers without making us very sick. So in other words, it comes into your cells, it kind of makes the photocopiers copies. It doesn't really destroy everything up in your nose, for example. And so therefore, you can now pass that virus to other people when you're breathing out. So that's why if I laugh, if I if I talk to you very closely, um, your my wind will now propel that virus to you and then you can pick it up. So that's why we heard people saying we went to a family party, nobody was coughing, sneezing, nobody was sick, and I got COVID-19. So that's when we started realizing that you don't have to be very ill and you can produce these viruses. Now, other people, the virus goes into your lungs and it starts to produce there and that damages your lungs. So those are the people that we hear about on ventilators, very sick in hospital. So there seems to be these two different versions, one where there's very little symptoms, if any, and then the second one, which means that the, the virus goes into your lung and does all this damage. And could it be, we've already talked about that spike protein and going into the lock and it can get into your cells. Could it be that some people have the lock where that spike protein fits perfectly and so therefore they can get into the lung cells and other people it doesn't fit very well so then you get some viruses in there but it only hangs around in your nose and that's how people can spread things around jumping off of that a number of questions and, and i know my colleagues and i were talking about this earlier uh, earlier this week but i'm getting a lot of questions around symptoms and i think a lot of that comes mm -hmm. from what we're seeing uh, south of the border as the incidence yes. of cases grows there we're seeing reports of strokes kidney yes. failure, blood clots, uh, rashes, stomach pains. I mean, it, I, I think back to a few months ago when we were first talking with you, Dr. Lin, and we thought it was a dry cough and shortness yes. of breath. And the list of right. symptoms has really grown. What, what can you tell us about that? Okay, so remember that lock system. So the virus has to attach to this locking system and then get into your cell. It has to be invited in. It's called the ACE2 uh, molecule that's sitting on our cells. Now, it sits on our lung cells. So that's why we focused on it. We say, oh, you'll breathe it in. It goes onto the lung cells. And then that's why you get shortness of breath and things like that. So then we started looking at where are these other ACE2 things, these molecules, these doorways. So it turns out it's in your intestine. So that's why people can have nausea, vomiting, that kind of thing. Uh, it is also found on the lining of your blood vessel. So in all our pipes, we have cells that line the inside. So therefore, if those, um, if those viruses go into there, it could damage the lining. And once you damage the lining, then your body thinks that it's like a cut because there's no covering there. So then your body starts to form blood clots to try and seal it up. Because when you cut yourself, that's the first thing your body does is it makes a blood clot to seal it up. So now you're forming these blood clots on the inside. Now the doctors knew about that one, so they started giving anticoagulants to make your blood thin. So if you're very sick and you go to a hospital, they give you blood thinners right away because they knew this was happening. But on top of that, you have all this inflammation. You're fighting a huge war, right? So in your body, you're fighting this huge war. And what happens with that inflammation, that causes clots everywhere else. So now they're saying there might be blood clots in your leg, mm -hmm. and then those can come up to your lung, and then now you have a clot in your lung. So we've had people present like that, where they have very, very sharp pain in their chest, and they can't breathe. And then now we're seeing some of these young people with these strokes-like symptoms. So those are clots that are happening elsewhere. So this massive inflammation, this war that's going on, is now starting to show up in these areas. And like I said, it, it's because the United States has such huge numbers, right? They're, you know, 1 million. So you're going to find all these strange things because there's only been like four or five cases reported of this blood clot, but you need large numbers of people uh, before we can see these weird things where the virus is attacking different parts of the body. We're also realizing that kidney failure is common as well. Uh, and that's partly because of all this inflammation and there's no good blood flow going to your kidneys as well. But there are those receptor things on the kidney so the virus could get into the kidney and infect them as well. So we're discovering that it could get into a whole bunch of places uh, and also by affecting your lungs and not enough oxygen, just by having no oxygen and all this inflammation, you can have all this damage uh, happening elsewhere in the body. Finally, before I let you go, Dr. Lin, I have a couple of questions here specifically about how we will know a vaccine works. And I thought it's, it's good to ask you about a vaccine because we have heard uh, a number of answers from politicians this week acknowledging that there is no guarantee, and even from Dr. Tam, that there will be a, a vaccine, uh, that it might, might instead be a suite or a set of treatments. Can you explain a bit about what the process is like for developing and testing a vaccine? And I know the attention being paid to this one is really unprecedented right now. 
Yeah. So just to just to make it clear, we have a flu vaccine, right? We have influenza every year and we still get influenza and people still die from influenza. So this idea that the vaccine will stop everything probably isn't true because the virus can change and mutate. So therefore, our vaccines may not work so well. So the way we would do it normally is we we grow some part of the virus. Usually it's that spike protein because that's the thing that's going to bind and do all the dirty work. So what we want to do is make an antibody against that. So we call those neutralizing antibodies, which means it's going to grab the business end so this virus cannot infect you anymore. We can make antibodies in our body. We're going to make antibodies against different parts of the virus. But if it's not that spiky part, then those ones aren't useful. So that's why when they test this, they're going to say, are these antibodies that we're giving you, in other words, we put in the protein into your body, your body then makes a, a weapon, the antibody against it. And is that one going to be the one that stops the virus from infecting you? So then they have to say, how long does it last? So they inject it into these people. How long does it last? And does it work? And is it safe to do so? Now, what you'll also notice is in the past, we used to just inject a little bit of protein into you, and then you would make the antibodies against that. Nowadays, they're trying different ways. They put the stuff into a virus, and then the virus is injected into you. The virus goes into your cells to teach your cells how to go and fight against this new virus. So there's a lot of different techniques that they're using. And that's also why they said we need to make sure that it's safe and that it works. And so that's why normally it's 10 years to develop a vaccine, because I need to be able to tell you when do you need a booster shot? And like, when does all this thing disappear? All these nice antibodies that you make over time, it might disappear. I need a lot of time to kind of figure it out. So therefore, normally it's 10 years, they're shrinking it down to one and a half years, or maybe even 12 months. There's one company, uh, the Oxford Group is saying maybe by the end of the year, they'll have a vaccine uh, that might be approvable. So they're, they're trying to push it forward uh, as fast as they can. But the whole idea is to put something into your body so that the, your body will recognize it and then build an army before the virus actually comes onto your body. So it's a good idea. That's the way we're going to get herd immunity, where if we have enough people vaccinated, then the virus can't find a host to make photocopies of itself. So in the end, the vaccine will be very helpful, but is it going to stop everything? Probably not. And remember, we've talked about this before, SARS never had a vaccine and no treatment, and it stopped. And that's because we didn't let it go to the next person. So as long as the virus can't find another person, uh, then the virus will stop. So this physical distancing, if we do it properly, we could stop the virus before we need the vaccine or anything else. Okay, well, thank you very much for that very clear explanation. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you, Dr. Lin. Good to see you again, Bessie. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.